Hi, my name's Ian Williamson. I'm pastor of New Life Church, Middlesbrough, and today I will be speaking on feeling defeated in ministry. <laughs> well, it's funny. I'm, I'm the pastor of New Life Church, Middlesbrough, which is in uh, the northeast of England. And prior to planting New Life Church, I'd read so many books. I'd been to conference after conference. I'd read blog post and listen to podcasts and, and watch videos and I was just so excited. I was excited at how God was uh, reviving the, the villages and towns and cities of the UK, how people were coming to faith in Jesus, of the baptisms, of, of church's growth. Uh, I, I was excited at how quickly church planting teams were, were being formed. I was excited at how quickly they were being mobilized and, and being sent to, to areas without churches. And I was excited at how quickly they found funding. And I heard stories and miracles of how church buildings were provided for something like a fiver. And that how people got a five-year salary overnight. I was absolutely buzzing. I was excited about the, the stories of conversions and baptism and discipleship. And I had a massive expectation that when I planted New Life Church Middlesbrough, that God was going to do exactly the same thing where I was through, through the church that I was planting, through the work and through the expectations that I had as a church planter. This was only five years ago. I was excited. I was full of expectations. And my expectations were built off the back of those blog posts, were built off the back of the videos that I'd watched, of the books that I'd read, and my own ambition, and my own desires, and my own pride. I was expecting to build a team of people who were excited about Middlesbrough as much as I was. I was excited to, to find people who wanted to fund the work that I was doing. I was excited that maybe we'd find a building and be able to buy our own building. I was excited because I was expecting to see people get saved week after week. And I was expecting to see our church grow through conversions. I thought over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years that we'd see our church double and triple and quadruple and that we'd have a massive revival in Middlesbrough. And then fast forward five years. This is where I get emotional. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm almost there. <laughs> but five years on, it's May 2018, and I'm sat in an apartment in Leaf with Mez, telling him, I can't do it. I've had enough. I, I, I'm going to have to pack in. That my expectations of what a church plant should be and what a church plant should be has just been shattered. I was tired, I was defeated, and I was depressed I'd seen every single expectation I had for New Life Church shattered. When I started, I started off with a mission plan, and I've seen quite a few people's church planting mission plans, and the wonderful, and the sensible, and the necessary, but I've never seen a mission plan that starts off by saying, within the first year of planting, I expect to see my wife electrocuted, to have been uh, people to attempt to burgle my house twice, to have a house fire, to... to, to for a loved one to die, uh, to be evicted from the house that we got electrocuted in. <laughs> I, I never put that in my mission plan for some reason. <laughs> I didn't put in my mission plan that we'd uh, excommunicate more people than we baptized. Uh, but that wasn't what was in my mission plan. My mission plan was full of expectations that were built on other people's stories. None of my expectations got met. Church planting was nothing like I had expected. But what should we expect from church planting? Where should we build our expectations if it isn't off other church plants, if it isn't off books and magazines? Well, I tell you, a good place to start is with God's Word. And a good place to start in God's Word is Haggai chapter 2. So if you'd like to turn with me to Haggai chapter 2, please. While you're finding that, I'll just let Mez know that it's one all between Man United and Bournemouth. <laughs> you what? Oh, I'm like me. Haggai chapter 2, yeah. Just before we look at God's word, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is alive, that your word is full of power and life, 
And we pray, Father, that as we look at your word now, you will speak to us, you will challenge us, you will encourage us, and you will equip us, Lord, to be more like your son Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, Haggai chapter 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty, and in this place I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. Let's look at God's Word. So just to give you a little bit of context, God's people, the Jews, had been taken into exile. And while they were in exile, uh, Cyrus had, had, had conquered Babylon, and he'd made a new law which allowed the Jews to return home and to rebuild the temple About 50,000 Jews journeyed home and they began to work on the temple. They were were excited at coming home, at being able to to rebuild the temple, at being able to worship God and work for God on mission. Two years later, they completed the foundation and there was great rejoicing we see in Ezra. We see God's people doing God's work. And this created opposition with the neighbors. The Samaritans and other people living by were fuming at the thought of God's people again regaining political and religious power of having the temple back. So they faced opposition. And because of the opposition, God's people bottled it and they stopped, they stopped building the temple. But a new, a new king came in place and, and created a law allowing God's people to start rebuilding the temple. And the, the people, instead of like taking advantage of this law, had become comfortable. They'd built buildings and they had a nice, comfy life. And they were satisfied building businesses rather than rebuilding God's kingdom. And in chapter 1, what we see is God's people being convicted by Haggai and being told to repent and to get back on a mission. And we see it. They're excited. They repent. They're back on mission And they're excited to be doing mission for God. But how long does the enthusiasm last for? If we look at the first three verses, it says, In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it seem like to you like nothing? So it's just a month has gone by since the people started rejoicing and rebuilding uh, God's temple, working for the Lord. They were excited. They were on mission. Then after a month, they're deflated and they're defeated. The enthusiasm is gone and now they're discouraged and they're dejected. In Ezra 3.12, it shows us that some of the people were old enough to remember the original temple. So they'll have had images in the head of what the original temple looked like in its, in its glory. And people will have heard God's word and would have understood how beautiful the temple it was. And when they've been uh, told about God's word as they were kids, they'll have grown up with an image in the head of what God's temple would look like. So their expectations of a temple would have been wonderful. Ezra 3.12 says, But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. You see, some of the people 
who were children when the original temple was destroyed, had the image of what they thought this new temple should look like. Some of the people would have had expectations of what they thought the temple should have looked like. And when they saw this new temple, that it was a lot smaller, that it was just had the foundations, they were discouraged and they were disappointed and they were dejected because their expectations weren't being met. So God is saying to his people, do you remember the original temple? Can you remember its former glory? Does this new temple seem like nothing to you? And these three verses reminded me so much of what I was going through when I was looking at what we were accomplishing with New Life Church Middlesbrough. You see, my idea, my expectations of what our church should look like was based on other people's churches that I'd visited, was based on books that I'd read, was based on my ambitions and my desires. I heard stories of how God was providing buildings and funding and gospel workers. And I was expecting the same thing to happen for us at New Life Church. I had high expectations. And I remember the excitement I had when we first planted and I was walking around the estate and I was praying with my wife and kids, and I, in my mind's eye, I had a vision of this wonderful, massive church that was going to be on this estate very, very soon. Yet five years on, we've got our lowest members. We've got 11 members lower than when we started five years ago. Some people have left for good reasons, but most have left for bad reasons. We found out that the building we're meeting in is getting sold and we could be made homeless within the next few months and we might have to start meeting in our living room again. I was discouraged because I was doing the work of God. But this work of God wasn't what I expected. I looked at all the other church plants that were growing, growing in converts, that were recruiting gospel workers, getting their own buildings, and I felt like the Jews... When I looked at New Life Church Middlesbrough, I felt this is nothing to me. It's pointless, it's hard work, and it's impossible. You see, my expectations of what God was going to do with New Life Church had been dashed. I thought we're not like that. I was full of envy, I was full of discouragement, I was full of bitterness, and I was full of defeat. And I wonder if there's any one of you here today is understanding what I'm talking about. Do you know what it feels like to be defeated when your expectations aren't being met? You see, when our expectations are built on anything but the Word of God, we are eventually going to be disappointed, discouraged, and defeated. We see that in verse 4, God continues to speak to his people. It says, but now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. See, God's people are feeling defeated. They're feeling weak. And God continues to speak to them to encourage them. Three times he tells his people to be strong. He says, I am with you, be strong. Do not be defeated. Finish the job, continue with the work that I have given you. Do not give up, you're not on your own. I am with you. Basically what he's saying is forget about the size of the job. How, how impossible it seems to you, forget about it. I've given you a task to do. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Get on with the work, you're not on your own. I am with you. You see, my expectations for New Life Church were built on what I thought I needed. I was basing my expectations at looking at other people, looking at what they had and what I didn't have. I was basing our value on 11 members having no building. We've asked for help, but, but no one's coming. There's nearly 40,000 people in the area that we've planted that aren't hearing the gospel of Jesus. I thought, we can't do it. We're too small. I was going mad, and I was getting frustrated. I was struggling with temptation. Family members were getting ill. We were seeing people fall away from the Lord rather than come to faith in the Lord. I, I buried more people than I baptized last year. 
Every day I was scouring the internet looking for a building that we could maybe move into, rent or buy. I was constantly writing blogs and, and funding bids. I was trying to promote the work and uh, constantly on social media, hoping that I'd put something that would attract some saviour to come and rescue us from, from this hard work that we had before us. I thought, if this building gets sold and we've got to move back into our living room, then I've failed as a church planter. I thought, if I can't grow the membership, then I've failed as a church planter. I thought, if I can't raise finances, then I've failed as a church planter. I was looking at all the practical sides of, of the church. I was building a church based on my expectations, based on my ambitions, based on my desires, based on my pride and what I thought a church plant should look like. And because it didn't look like the image I had in my head, I felt defeated and I wanted to give up. I felt weak. And that's no surprise, is it? Because when our expectations are built on anything but the Word of God, we will feel discouraged, we will feel weak, and we will feel defeated. I was like the Jews, I was looking at the practical side of things. I saw the size of the task, and it frightened me. I felt ill-equipped, and I felt like giving up. But I need reminded that I wasn't alone, that God was with me. I needed to be reminded that I could be strong because God was with me. And if you're struggling in your ministry, do you need reminding this morning that you are not alone, that God is with you, that even though you feel weak, that you can carry on with the work because God has the strength to get you through it like he got me through it, like he got his people through it who were building the temple. The next verse says, This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. God reminds his people that he's made them a promise. He promises them that if they are faithful, then he will bless them. He reminds them that he rescued them from Egypt, that he took them through the Red Sea, that he took them, protected them, and provided them for them in the desert, that he took them into the land of their enemies, that he defeated their enemies, that he created a nation for them. And even when they disobeyed him and they were taken into exile, he rescued them and he brought them back home to the promised land to rebuild his kingdom, to rebuild their nation. God is saying, I have never left you. I will never leave you. And he says that to us too. God is with us. He will never leave us. And I've been stressing out for months because the building's about to be sold. I was thinking constantly, will, will we have enough money to buy it? Will I have enough money for my salary? Will I raise enough money for the interns? Where will we go if we don't have enough money for the building? Where will we go if we lose the building? What will we do? You see, that, that uncertainty of the building, that uncertainty of finances came as a shock to me. But it didn't shock God. You see, before New Life Church was planted, God knew that that building was going to be sold. Before the creation of the universe, God knew that building was to be sold. God knows every single person who has been and gone. He knows the people who have been disciplined and excommunicated. He knew about every problem we'd face as a family or as a church. You see, nothing surprises God. Even though we're shocked and surprised, God is never surprised. God has a plan and his will will be done. You see, if our expectations are built on anything but the word of God, ultimately, we will be discouraged and defeated. We will feel fear when our expectations aren't being met. But if we build our expectations on his word, we have nothing to fear. Because his word says in Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, there will be times when we struggle. There will be times when we don't know what's happening. There will be times when our plans fail, but there will never be a time when God's plans fail. 
We can trust in God because God is in control. Verses 6 to 8 continue. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. God is saying, look, listen up. My will will be done. Regardless of the state of the weather, regardless of the state of the country, whether there's war or whether there is peace, my will will be done. I will provide for you. Trust in my provision. Trust in my promises. Trust in my word. I will not be glorified because what you do for me. I will be glorified because I am glorious. God has given New Life Church a mission to go and make disciples. And whether that is in the church building or in my living room, that is irrelevant. Because God is not glorified by a church building or by a living room. God is glorified because he is glorious. Far too often we can be distracted by what we want, what we don't have, what we think we need. We're distracted from our mission and we spend time consumed worrying about things that we cannot change rather than just getting out there and doing the mission that God has put before us. When we feel defeated, we need reminding that we have all we need to obey God. We have all we need to go on mission for God. That is his word, and that is his Holy Spirit. God's word tells us that we need to stop putting trust in our own strength. We need to stop putting trust in our resources, in our people, in our building, in our finances. We need to start putting our trust in him, in his power and in his provision. You see, when our expectations are built on anything else than the word of God, we will ultimately be defeated and discouraged. And as a church, we can serve God knowing that regardless of the circumstances, he is in control he will provide and he will be glorified. As individuals, we need to remember the same thing for our own lives as well. This afternoon, we need to ask ourselves, is our situation, is our struggles, is our lack of resources discouraging us? Do we need reminding that our ability to serve God and obey his word is not restricted by what we do and don't have? Our strength and our resources do not help us obey God. Our ability to serve God is enabled by his unlimited power. Verse 9 says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. See, this new temple was being built without the former glory, of the old temple, there was no gold and there was no silver. And even though years later it was restored to something like what it originally was by uh, King Herod, the glory was never in its design. It was never in its opulence. It was never in its treasure. The glory of the temple was in who the temple pointed to, was in who eventually worshipped in the temple, which is our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, 6, Jesus tells us that something greater than the temple is here. You see, God's people's mission, their work of rebuilding the temple, was merely to point to Jesus. That is where their value was based, in who their work was pointing to, not what they were actually doing. Their value didn't lay in their resources, didn't lay in how the temple looked, it didn't lay in the decorations. Their value laid in Jesus Christ. The very same Jesus who removes the need for a temple by bringing peace between man and God and between man and the world. You see, to be honest, New Life Church became an idol to me. Growing membership, getting a building, building a support base, building a team, Outreach, seeing the growth of the church, 
was about New Life Church and was about me and my desires. It was an idol. These things might have been good things, but none of them were the main thing. The main thing is what New Life Church should be pointing to, and that's Jesus. Our mission, our ministries, our churches will become an idol to all of us when as soon as it stops pointing to Jesus. And we will feel defeated if we place our value in the size of the church, in the number of converts, in the size of our building, in our worship style, in our staff members, where we meet, how we meet, the number of baptisms, or the salvation that we see. We will be defeated if any of these things become priority to us. Our value has nothing to do with what we do as a church or as individuals. The value of our ministries is not about what we can do for Jesus, but about what Jesus has done for us. Our faithful preaching on his perfect birth, on his perfect life, on his perfect death, on his perfect resurrection, on his perfect ascension, is what brings value to us as ministers and as churches and as gospel workers. It's our faithful preaching about our faithful Lord and Saviour that brings us value, that measures our success. I was constantly feeling defeated because my expectations were based on what I thought made a good church plant, what I thought was successful, rather than what the Word of God says is success. And all of us need to take a regular checkup to see what are our ministry is pointing to. Are they pointing to our fame and desires or are they pointing to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? Our motivation for what we are doing must be to glorify Jesus or all of us will be defeated. So if we want to avoid being defeated, we need to base our expectations on the Word of God. And the Word of God is clear. It says that we should expect the same struggles that God's people face when rebuilding the temple. We should expect to face opposition. But when we do, we can remind ourselves of Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We should also expect to be tempted by comfort. I think I deserve better than this. I deserve an easy life. This is too hard for me. But when we're tempted by the temptation of comfort, we need to remind ourselves that there's no comfort like the comfort that God brings us. By looking at 2 Corinthians 1.5, it tells us that for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we want to make an idol of comfort, we need to look for that comfort that only Jesus Christ can bring us. There'll be days when we're overwhelmed by the size of the task. And when that happens, we can remind ourselves of Jeremiah 32, 17. Our sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. So when we're feeling like the job is too big for us, praise the Lord, because we'll lean on Jesus, who is greater than any obstacle that has put before us. There'll be times when we should expect to doubt God's faithfulness and provision. And then we need to remind ourselves of Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And when we doubt that God's in control, we read Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man's plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. But most importantly, we should expect that at times we will lose sight of our prize, and we need to be reminding ourselves of what our prize is daily and throughout the day. Psalm 73, 25, 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In our ministries, we'll have days like the exiles who return to rebuild the temple. We'll have good days, days of blessings and days of excitement. And we'll have days where we'll struggle to get out of bed 
we'll feel discouraged, we'll feel disappointed, we'll feel tired and we'll want to give up. We'll also have days where we can't sleep for excitement at the wonder of what God is doing in individuals' lives when we see people rescued from drug abuse and rescued from criminality and we see families restored. We'll be excited and we'll want to get up early in the morning and praise Jesus and go out and preach the gospel. And then we'll have days when we're frightened by the uncertainty of what the future holds. We'll have days when we're feeling defeated, when we're feeling tired and we're feeling discouraged. Yet during those days, we can always rejoice. We can rejoice because of Jesus, because of Jesus who gives us access to the throne room of God where we can boldly go to our Father in heaven and receive all the strength, all the courage, all the motivation and all the peace that we need to avoid feeling defeated and experience his victory so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, faithfully preach his word. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just come before you and need reminding of the prize before us, Lord, which is your beautiful son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection and his ascension, Lord, and we look forward to that day when he returns. Father, we thank you for your patience and delay in that return. Help us, Lord, to faithfully preach your word so that we can see all the souls that you have elected before the beginning of time brought into your kingdom. Father, we rejoice at the thought of your return. We rejoice at the thought of salvation. We rejoice at the thought of churches being planted, regardless of building size, membership sizes, but with the important thing of faithfully preaching your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So... Do you want to just introduce yourself, tell us just where you are, who you are, and how long you've been in ministry? If we can just go along. Uh, Mark Selway, um, church and community worker up at uh, Grace Mount Church Plant, uh, currently three and a half years in. Hmm. Ian Williamson, New Life Church Middlesbrough since 2007. I'm Sarah Prime, I do uh, children's and youth work at Grace Mount Community Church. I've um, been doing youth work for about 14 years in the area. Pete Stewart, been working in Glasgow full time since 2015, and we planted January this year. So, the numbers on the screen, if you want to text questions in, I can fire a few, but if you want to put your hand up and interrupt, then you can. Let's just ask a kind of general question to start off with, off the back of Ian's talk. How have the other three of you kept on going in ministry when it feels like you're defeated, feels like you've hit a brick wall, feel like you've been burned? Who wants to kick off? Yeah. Yeah. So three and a half years in full-time ministry has brought three major events in our life as a family. Um, so not long after we moved down, our daughter, who was anorexic and bulimic, tried to take her own life, which was a, a massive impact on our family. Um, a year and a half ago, my ex-wife passed away, leaving my three boys without their mum. Um, that had a massive impact on our family. And then a uh, matter of months, ago our little boy stopped breathing for a couple of minutes which was probably one of the hardest things uh, that we've gone through and you know that's been difficult for us both as husband and wife and a family to deal with um, on each one of them occasions I think I spoke to you and said um, enough's enough I'm not doing this anymore I'm not putting my family uh, through this you know in life uh, you go through sort of like that feeling that um, Everything's an attack from the devil, right? You know, you, you're on ministry, you're in front line. You know, you're very helpful in pointing out that, you know, some things are just life, they happen. Some things that happen are consequence of sin, past mistakes. Other things are attack from the devil. Um, and, you know, my, my default setting is when things are hard in ministry is to want to bolt. Go back to what I know best. Uh, go back to where I'm safe and secure. Um, but scriptures that you mentioned, uh, you know, if, if God is for us, who can stand against us? You know, we have currently over our son's cot, Psalms 121. Uh, we can sleep at night because our Heavenly Father doesn't. Um, and that's a comfort that we get. But it is, you have your wobbly moments. I have my wobbly moments. Um, but drawing comfort from God's word is what keeps me going. 
Sarah, you've been in Gracemount 14 years doing youth work, lots of ups and downs, lots of time on your own. Do you want to tell us how you've endured, what some of the pressures have been? Yeah, um, I think one of the big things for me is like, especially the times that I felt really defeated is to remember what God has done. So remind myself of the gospel um, every day, but also the answers to prayers um, that have happened over the years just to remember God's faithfulness in that. Um, I think what Ian was saying was really helpful in terms of expecting opposition. So I think when you first start out, it can be quite seen as quite a glamorous thing to do, like, oh, you're going in to do all this. And yeah, you can have like the wrong expectations. And I think also just guarding yourself against comparing to other people, as Ian mentioned as well, um, just remembering that um, it's God that you're working for. It's not about numbers. It's not about... Um, yeah, who, who's seemingly in the world's eye is, is doing better, but it's just about being faithful and, um, yeah, yeah. persevering. I'm going to come to a different question for you. What was the name of the talk you did at last weekend there? I think the one you're talking about is, was just the lessons from failure thing, yeah. wasn't it? So, so, yeah. yeah. Mays wrote that, I wouldn't actually, it was really good. <laughs> but it would, be, it would be worth referencing if you've been kind of tickled by Ian's one and you want to be tickled again. Pete's one on uh, failure and kind of wrestling with that was really good from a couple of years ago. Pete, a slightly different question. How, how do we help... I guess this is kind of expectations for those who are funding us, those who are praying for us. How do we help them understand some of this stuff, realising that we're not going to be a, in three years you'll be self-sufficient, all these kind of things? Because that's... It is a pressure in the midst of ministry, right? I think what... Ian, Ian smashed it, didn't he? Like it's, um, it's about having our expectations flow from the Bible and what God's expectations are and not our own worldly ideas of what planting the church looks like. Um, for, that was a personal thing for me. I had to redefine that. I had to show people, I think, therefore, that success is not having this a massive self-funded church. In a year or three years, success for me is still getting up out of bed in the morning and still trusting Jesus. Like, and... And I want that, I mean, that, that's where we're starting from. And then we just know that ministry is hard. Like that talk we did a couple of years ago was the whole point was when you're the parable of the sower, and you throw the seed out and you're not in charge of where the seed goes, you throw the seed out and three quarters of that is going to fail. And that's like a biblical expectation. That you're, most of what you do is going to fail. And yet God is so good and God is so glorious that he takes those one and twos that fall and, and something amazing comes through that. We're not in charge of that. And so therefore... You know, so you look at Andy Prime, Grace Point, and it looks like it's going great. And you know, so many people are getting saved, and you see all these busy services. You look at Berlanark, and oh, everything's going wrong. And there might be things I need to learn, but I think I need to lure myself and tell people that the difference here is not your skill. The difference here is the grace of God, isn't it? Mm. He'll do what he's going to do. If we're faithful yeah. um, to his call in our life, then we need to trust him with what yeah. he's doing. With and us. the grass is not always greener, so yeah, Grace Point is not green. <laughs> Well, there is some green, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? Ian, do you want to talk on that in terms of expectations from those that you're trying to get funding from on this stuff, or do you want to, I can throw another question at you. I've got another one. Yeah, another question. Okay. You might not want this one either. <laughs> uh, how would you know when it's time to pack up and leave? How would you know if a church plant has failed? But this, yeah. it's something Seriously, we wrestle with, right? Yeah, I think there's a time to packing and failing. And it's not when you're defeated hmm. because you're selfish and you're tired and you've made loads of mistakes, which I have. Uh, I think there's a time to move on, but I think you've got to move on with, with a clean head and a clear heart and, and know that you're moving on for the right reasons, not because you're just tired and want to give up and you've done everything in your own strength, which, again, I, I tend to do. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a right way to... I don't know, you know when to give up, don't you? You know when to let go. I think sometimes we can, like, it's natural for me to bolt. When the going gets tough, I get gone. Yeah. And, and that's my natural instinct, just to give up. Uh, yeah, I think taking wise counsel, I spent a couple of days with Mez and just sat, had a couple of pizzas and a bottle of lager and said, this is how I'm struggling. And Mez just sat with me and I assessed the whole situation. At the end, we both came to a rational decision that church plans are a tough gig. And I was tired, I needed to prepare my time better, I needed to trust in God more, 
And I think at the end of that assessment, it, it could have gone the other way and said, you're a loser, you need to pack in. Uh, I, I, I think there are times where, do you know what? There's just some areas that we're going through that are just tough. And, and, and do you know what? I was speaking to a brother earlier on today who, when you're not supported, I think sometimes you, for the good of your health, for the sake of your family, you need to get out of there because uh, dead planter is no good to anyone, is there? And if you can't get that support, sometimes I think it's wise to pack in and have a rest and, and maybe just go back at a later date. And I think what saved me was, was having Mez and the support of the planters from 20 Schemes. Questions come in. What are the bad ways you've been tempted to respond to the feeling of defeat? I, how can we beware of putting band-aids on our defeat? Anyone want to deal with that? Blaming everybody else. Hmm. Blaming the sovereignty of God and not taking the opportunity to learn yourself. Hmm. Um, so there's, we've made tons of mistakes. It's not that hmm. it is by God's grace that these things grow, but we also have responsibility in how we do that. I think for a while it would be easy for me to, to play that you know, pity card and, oh, poor me, look what God's doing. And I need to learn. Mm. I'm an idiot. Like, mm. I need to grow. And, yeah. Any questions from the floor? I feel like a lot of people are just saying amen to a lot of that talk, right? It's necessary. Like, I, I was stupid. I, uh, we had a team, we, we planted my wife and my two kids, no experience. Uh, we did it the hard way, the stupid way, no support, and ran ourselves into the ground. And uh, if there's anyone out there now who <laughs> fancies copying my model of church planting, don't get in touch with church in hard places, get hooked up if you're in Scotland with 20 schemes or whoever, you need to be part of a network. It's essentially a part of a wider organization than just yourself, because that is just setting yourself up to fail. And uh, I was gung-ho and a bit of a lone ranger, and I've learned from my mistakes, and that's the best advice that I'd give you, is, is join a network like Acts 29 Church in hard places or 20 schemes. Sarah, one's coming for you. How do you stay encouraged when it seems like there is little fruit from your ministry? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think remembering that you're not people's saviour, like remembering that it's God, like Pete was saying, um, we're just, it's God that's going to bring the growth. And so I guess for me, um, I've struggled sometimes having shared the gospel with kids and young people for years and years and years and not seen any fruit, but just trusting that actually God will bring growth in his perfect timing if it's his will and so yeah like I can think of kids now that have all of a sudden come back round as adults that um, we shared the gospel with for years and we thought there was no hope for them but now we're um, back involved with the church and so um, yeah just remembering that we just need to be faithful to what God's called us to do each day and not try to see into the future or yeah well, let me read from the scriptures, then I'll get, if the band could jump up, we're going to sing as we end this session. Let me read this, something that Saul shared in our prayer meeting this week in Grace Mount. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And those three things, right, the, the farmer, the soldier, the athlete, either involve really hard graft or they guarantee suffering. And the only thing that keeps us going in these things is that the athlete knows there's a prize, the farmer knows that there's a harvest, and the soldier knows that he's got a master who's already won the war. And so he says, be strengthened, not in yourself, but in grace. So should we pray? And then we'll sing. Our Father in heaven, we want to pray particularly for these people up here, but for everyone in the room, for everyone who's... Uh, either sighing an amen or your spirit is interceding where our words cannot express some of the hurt and the, the emptiness 
the, the running on empty that we feel. And so we simply, we cry out, Father, please strengthen us by your grace and fix our eyes on the victory won at Calvary, fix our eyes on the prize that is guaranteed by the resurrection and on the harvest that you will bring. And so we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.